Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor and today we're going to be looking at the 8.12 PBE changes with particular attention to the support changes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the fighter slash bruiser type of changes with the new Atmas returning and the Spear of Sojin and all of that. And then I'll hit on some of the other changes that are on the, um, on the upcoming patch as well. So keep in mind this is the PBE. So all of these changes are not guaranteed to go through, and some of them, uh, some of the stats on these changes will probably change over time before the patch goes out next week. All right, I just it seems like a lot of people really like the last PVE video that I did, so I'm going to try to do this every other week. Whenever there's not a patch that week, I'm going to try to do a PVE video on the Wednesday just to get people uh, my thoughts on the overall meta right now and on the proposed changes that are going on uh, during the next cycle. So. If you don't have time to watch the whole thing, remember you can always find the timestamps in the description. I also have an, uh, give you access to the Google Doc in the description as well. If you like the content, don't forget to like and subscribe so other people can find it as well. And it'll also give you some notifications whenever I come out with more content. I'm coming out with new stuff every day. And come out and join us for stream sometime if you want. It's 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every night. I try to be as informative as possible and as interactive with the stream as possible. Um, as I play, we laugh, we have a good time, we have a great community of regulars, it's a super friendly, um, just awesome group of people that are more than happy to have you in there. Uh, we chat about league stuff, we just chat about random stuff in life, it's just, it's a really good, wholesome community, and that's pretty hard to find these days, I think, um, unfortunately, in a lot of the gaming community, and so, it's got a lot of stuff going for us, so come check it out sometime if you'd like. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about these changes. Okay, so the overall things that I think are really problematic right now in this meta, just structurally, are I think the jungle XP and items are too strong early. I know that last patch, you know, that was supposed to be a huge nerf for the junglers. I don't believe that. I think that the junglers are still much higher level than the bot lane, oftentimes. And I think the persistent problem, which is fine in and of itself, but the problem is that it's just too easy to camp bottom. It's still just too easy, and especially after the 80 carry nerfs um, on this patch, you know, if your team doesn't have Kai'Sa or Lucian, or maybe a competent Draven player, then you just don't have an early game. You know, Caitlyn, Jinx, Kog'Maw, all of these people are just so easy for junglers to gank, and they just don't have enough power to fight back. And a lot of people now are doing these level 2 bot runs where they just get the scuttle and then just sit on bot lane, and there's not enough of uh, punishment if people just want to sit on your lane. I've been watching a lot of other sort of people thinking about the meta and talking about the meta these days. And that's one, I don't remember who said that, but I heard someone else say it and I was like, I think that's a really good idea is that there's just not enough punishment for people to just sit in your lane. Like they're not, they're going to lose out a little bit on their jungle farm, but by and large, some of these power clear junglers, they can just clear and just sit on bot lane, and even if they don't kill you, they're still going to put you far enough behind and deny enough resources to where you're effectively not going to be in the game. And then, you know, once the mid laner also gets level 4 or 5 now, then they can just go down and 4-man, either dive bottom or force you off the tower and just take it. Because now, you know, if you don't have a mid laner that can also push, and there's fewer and fewer mid laners that can push then um, they're not going to be able to punish you for going down bottom and four-man diving. And so I think that bot just is a punching bag a lot of times in this meta. And I, the major way to fix that, I believe, is to give bot lane a little bit more power early on. Um, but primarily to make the jungle, like make the jungler have to go do their camps more. So either make the camps tougher so it takes longer to clear them, make them spawn faster, so make them give less resources, less gold, less experience, um, but make them spawn more regularly so that they have to check in and clear that jungle more often. So maybe make them spawn every 90 seconds or something instead of, I think it's two minutes, it's like two minutes or two minutes and 15 seconds right now. I'm not entirely sure. I think it's like 2.15 on the jungle spawns, um, but just lower that a lot. Just make it like a minute 30 or something and just say, look, um, you know, if you want to sit bottom and the other person just wants to power farm the jungle and power farm your jungle, then they're going to get really far ahead of you. So there's actually a price that you pay um, for not going bottom. Because right now, it's basically 
these very powerful early game junglers like Graves and Zhen Zhao in particular that can fight everyone else early on, you can't go down there and contest them 3v3. So, you know, you might say, well, the other jungler can come down there and help you out bot lane. If they don't have Zen or Graves, no, they can't. You know, if you have that jungler on your team that just feels like they want to play a Moo Moo jungle or, I don't know, just anything that's not Zen or Graves, I mean, even something that's pretty, you know, respectable still, like, I don't know, maybe a Skarner or um, a Kane or, you know, just something like that, it, they're still going to be in big trouble early on. And so I think there's just not enough penalty for camping bottom. So either make the jungle more challenging, make the top of the map more interesting, so maybe you could have Rift Herald spawn earlier and be a little bit easier to take down. Maybe you could make the dragon tougher to take down. That's something they definitely should do. Because right now, if they just oppress bottom and just sit down there and lock out vision control, then they can go just do the dragon really easily, very early, before you can get any more vision on it. Right. So before you can even get your wards up on your warding item to ward it, then some of these junglers can just go in there and do the dragon very efficiently. Like Zen, I think, can go in there and do it pretty early. So he's early game aggression. He can clear pretty well. He can fight pretty well. And he can take dragons really well. Um, so I think that's really problematic. So anyways, I, I would make the jungler like... I'm not saying they should have to stay in their jungle and clear 24-7. But I'm saying that they shouldn't have these vast windows of time, like one minute, where they can just do whatever they want and just camp a lane. Because uh, I think that's just deciding too many matchups early on. It's like, you can still do that, but you're going to fall behind by some measurable value other people if you do that. Um, so yeah, just make the dragon tougher early on. Maybe make the towers a little bit tougher so it's harder to dive. Make them hit harder early on. Um, could be a thing. Uh, just something to disincentivize people from um, camping bot lane. You could also increase the power of bot lane, but I don't mind like I don't mind eighty carries and even even if it has to be supports, like taking a little while to power up and come online, if that means they're gonna be some of the most powerful things late game, I think that's debatable right now. Like I said, if it's not Lucian, if it's not Kaisa, you're just not even gonna get to late game a lot of times. You know, the Fed Fizz or LeBlanc or um, Irelia or you know, Graves, or just whatever. Every role has so much more damage, and all of their champions come online so much faster than every AD carry that's not named Lucian or Kai'Sa, um, that it's just, it's a huge problem. And bot lane is always behind in XP. This would be another thing that I think would be great, is increase the XP of bot lane. I'm not saying they should be the exact same level as mid lane, but I am saying that I think it's kind of inappropriate that mid lane in the mid game once the lanes break that the mid laner is three or four levels over the support like that's ridiculous you know because what are you supposed to do when you're a support soraka and fizz is like you know level 12 or level 13 when you're level nine and you're walking around trying to ward the jungle like the levels matter so much like you get an extra point in your skills which dramatically increases your damage um, for a lot of these assassin champions, you of course have a lot more HP, you have a lot more mana, attack speed, armor, magic resist, everything you get when you level up. Like, levels are extremely powerful in League of Legends. You know, I'm not going to go over the full gold breakdown, but we're talking like a couple of thousand gold worth of value, you know, whenever you level up probably, at least a thousand. It depends on how you want to value the... Um, the skills and all that and it depends on the champion some champions are more powerful when they level than others either way i just think it's inappropriate and i've had times also where like you can get camped by the jungler and even if you don't die you just get denied like maybe half a wave of cs or you get pushed out of lane um early on because the jungler shows up and you know chunks you down to half health and you don't have your flash you're out of potion so you have to back you've missed a couple of waves and then you come back, and you're level 4, and then their level 6 Twisted Fate, like, teleports on top of you. It's like, I mean, because you don't have your flash anymore, like, I don't know. It just feels like there's, it's just too, it, bottom lane is just too much of a punching bag. And they need to do something about that. So I think just make it more dangerous. Make junglers have to pay a higher price, either by increasing the jungle power or by making the top of the map more attractive for junglers to go there. By making Rift Herald, like make Rift Herald spawn earlier and make it like something that actually comes up every five minutes or so. Um, 
throughout the game. I would just, I would try to find a way, honestly, just see if you could make it a permanent fixture top lane. Like, allow Rift and Baron to coexist top lane. I mean, that might involve, like, restructuring some of the jungle and things like that. But just have there constantly be, um, just some type of objective that you can do. I don't know. I guess I don't mind it being replaced. But, like, have it come online earlier and just make it, um, something that's persistent. I guess. I don't know. Just, like, make it rival dragons in terms of, like, ease and effectiveness to take early on. That That's what I think. Because right now, it's just not worth it. Like, Rift doesn't spawn until 10 minutes, and it takes forever to kill the thing by yourself for a lot of the time. And it's, like, a, it's an okay bonus, but dragon is just so simple. You just walk up, and you can solo it a lot of times. As a jungler, many of these junglers at level 4 or 5, you know, so they can grab this thing solo at, like, you know, 6 minutes into the game. And if you get a kill bot lane, then you get, or if you like, if you get a successful gank bot lane, you can get two kills, first tower blood, and dragon. Like, that's so much. Like, there's no other lane where that happens most of the time. You're not going to be able to kill mid lane, since it's a short lane most of the time, and it's really hard to dive it. If you do kill it, you're not going to take the tower immediately, because there's only going to be two people there. Same thing with top lane. It's not a short lane, but if you get a kill top, a lot of times you're not taking that tower early, unless you have two very good tower taking champions, the top lane or the jungler. Um, it's just not going to happen because there's only two people there and the top laner has teleport a lot of times. The person you just killed, so they're going to be able to teleport back to lane and defend the tower. Whereas bot lane, like I say, if you get that kill, you're going to, if you get a double kill, first of all, that's twice as many kills. Second of all, you're going to have three champions at least bottom. If you sent your mid laner there also, you're going to have four champions, which means you take that tower super quickly and then you're all grouped up already, ready to transition over, grab dragon, and back and i mean what what's the enemy mid laner gonna do if they don't follow if they fell asleep at the wheel or they got pushed in or whatever and their teleports down they, they can deny like maybe one or two waves mid lane before the uh the diving mid laner the one who went bottom goes back and the, the one who went bottom might even have their teleport back they can just teleport straight back to lane i think teleport's a major problem too i think it's too easy um to cover up a lot of mistakes with teleport and a lot of bot laners are even taking that now i've watched like a double lift highlight reel and he was taking teleport bottom on like a lucian not even ezreal like some people at worlds or not worlds at msi mid-season um started taking teleport on ezreal because they're like well we're not gonna fight early anyways we're always just gonna poke and so we might as well take teleport so we can get better back timings uh, but now other people are copying that even on non um non Ezreal champion so Lucian would want to fight he would want heal but double lift still wanted teleport just so that you could defend bottom better probably because you're going to get camped and so you know if you have to back early unless you want to lose your tower or lose several waves you might have to teleport back and so when when the bot laner is taking teleport and the mid laner and the top laner which is what's happening in a lot of these games that I'm observing at the challenger level teleport is just too powerful so I think they um They've got to find some way to limit that. Either, like, increase the cooldown on it, or it's already a pretty long cooldown. I'm not sure what the solution would be. Or increase the power of combat summoners, like increase ignite more, increase the usefulness of barrier more. Some of these other combat summoners just aren't used that much. Like, make it a much bigger trade-off if you're going to take teleport. Um... I mean, they could also consider bringing back some summoners like Promote, which would help with pushing to kind of counteract Teleport. I don't know. I mean, that could be dangerous. I don't, I don't want to go into that. It's, that's getting kind of theoretical, but something needs to be done about Teleport probably to some extent. But anyways, bot lane needs help. So that's that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking here. And the overall damage in the game is just too high. Games are ending too early. I was watching Beyond the Rift with like Scara and um, I'm a cutie pie. I've been listening to a lot of those lately, and everybody just kind of agrees that damage is just way too high. This is like preseason level type of damage. And you know I understand why they're doing it. They didn't say this, but my theory is they want faster games to try to keep up with things like Fortnite. So like. Fortnite is putting a lot of pressure on League right now because they're offering a more, you know, casual type of game. Games are very fast. People can just queue up, play a game. It doesn't take forever. And <clears throat> it feels like you, you know, solo carry in Fortnite, right? Because it's Battle Royale. It's sort of you, 1v, you know, 99. 
the rest of the people, and they can't emulate that all the way in League, but what they want is they want people to be able to snowball much harder. That's a designed goal, because one of the big complaints that, you know, if you watch any of these other content creators that complain about League and want to leave League or, you know, all this stuff, a very common complaint is that people feel like if they just get into a team, um, if they just get into a game, no matter how well they do, if they have four dumb teammates, then they're going to lose the game. True. That's the nature of a team game. That should happen. <laughs> okay? That should happen. If the enemy team is better than yours, you should lose. And that's okay. Right? Because sometimes your team's going to be better, sometimes their team's going to be better. That's called working with a team. You know? <clears throat> sometimes the best player in a game doesn't always win every single game. But if you play enough games the best people rise to the top. So the problem is people don't have a long enough perspective. They just think about that one game and they're like, man, that game was impossible. I had this guy who went 0-15 top lane. True. There are some games where it's impossible for you to lose. Also, right? There's some games where your top laner goes 15-0 and and then maybe you are a mid laner and you went 0-5 and, and you win the game. But you'll, you won't think about that as much. A lot of people won't right? They'll just be like, well, it's just a matter of business. You know, I kind of had a tough lane anyways, because the jungler camped me and that let this top laner roam free. And that, that's really why the person went 15 and 0 top lane is because the jungler camped me so much. So I have an excuse for being 0 and 5, right? But then fast forward to two games down the line where your um, top laner goes 0 and 15 and the jungler camps them the whole time. And then you're like maybe 1 and 0 mid lane. And then you're going to complain oh, that person died so much top lane. They're so terrible. You know, I'm 1-0 in my lane, and that's fine. It's like, well, you didn't push your advantage, did you? You didn't go 15-0, just like that person did a couple of games ago when there was no jungle pressure. You didn't shatter your lane. <clears throat> and so I think a lot of it is just selective memory. People just tend to remember um, the bad things more, unfortunately. You're going to remember the person on your team that feeds really hard, but you're not going to think anything about it or remember the person on your team who was really awesome that carried you the game. You had a bad game. But nevertheless, regardless of how true that is or just how much that reveals about our own psychology and culture, that's how people feel, right? And so they're trying to change that to where if you do well, you can carry the game hard. And so that means necessarily that there has to be stronger snowball mechanics, right? So that if someone gets ahead, they stay ahead and they can close. There's less chance for throws. Right, and so that's why they've tried to um, pile more gold on the tower taker. They've piled more gold on individual people for shutdowns. So they say if you get a shutdown, you're going to get all of that gold. You're not going to have to split it with anyone. You get a tower, you're going to get a lot more of that gold. You're not going to split it with other people. So if you're doing things like taking towers and getting shutdowns, you individually are going to get a lot more gold. And that's a feels good for people that do that, right? So if you're the chosen one in that game, if you're the person who gets really far ahead... Um, then that can feel really good because then you can say, okay, my team's underperforming, but I've got all this gold. I'm playing a super hard carry champion and I can win anyways. But it's a feels bad when it's on the enemy team, right? When they have that Rengar that's like 6-0 and or something, it can feel like it's almost impossible to stop some of these champions because they have so much damage. They can blow people up um, and they just snowball really hard because they've nerfed the tanks into oblivion in other roles because... People don't like tanks. I don't mind tanks. I like tank matters. The thing about tanks, and people say, well, you know, these games are lasting a long time and team fights are taking forever. There's counterplay a lot of times. I think there's more counterplay to tanks than there is to assassins. Because with the tank, he's not going to kill you in under one second. You know, a Sejuani rolls up out of the jungle and, you know, if there are a bunch of tanks running around, the fight's going to last for like 20 seconds. You're going to have plenty of time, usually, to adjust your positioning to, you know, switch targets, to use your abilities on different, you know, champions. You're going to have different interesting decisions to make in a team fight that lasts 15 seconds, right? You're going to say, okay, you know, I can use this ability here. I can use this summoner here. I position here. And you can sit there and you can go back and analyze and learn from that. You can say, all right, I should have, uh, you know, prioritized this other champion instead, or I should have peeled this champion or used my resources in this other way, right? It's interesting. Like, you have choices, Right? You had plenty of opportunities to make the right call. It's not based on do you have the like physical reflexes to press flash 0.1 seconds faster 
to avoid the Rengar before he jumps. This is especially annoying for older players like me, right? I'm 34. Even for non-pro players, just people who don't have that lightning fast reflex time. My reflexes are okay, but sometimes I am a tenth of a second slow on some of these reflexes, and that's just what happens when you get a bit older, and it, it is frustrating, um, you know, when that happens. And so I just feel like there's not as much counterplay to Rengar jumping out or Talon popping over a wall and just instantly deleting you, especially when you can't play a tank. Like, tanks are usually kind of the check, right? If it's like Paper, Rock, Scissors in League with a lot of champion types, then, you know, if Scissors are the AD carry or if Scissors are the assassins, then tanks are the rock, right? And so, and then you've got, well, how do you deal with tanks? AD carries. So that's kind of like the holy trinity of League historically is, okay, AD carries, fantastic against tanks because they do really good sustained damage over time. Um, but they have very little defenses, so they're weak to assassins who do very high burst damage but have low sustained damage. And then assassins are weak against tanks because the assassins don't have good sustained damage over time and tanks can absorb their burst damage and crowd control them to death. And so you've had this, what I think is a really good, clean, fair, sort of paper, rock, scissors way of team composition, right? Where each thing had an answer. 80 carries, assassins were good against those. Tanks were good against the assassins. And then 80 carries were good against the tanks. Seems good. It <laughs> seems good to me. And then if you want somewhere in between, not just those three types of things, then you can get into things like fighters or bruisers. I think personally that fighters are very toxic because, you know, oftentimes they'll have a lot of defense and a lot of offense. And so I think that champions like that are historically very problematic to balance, like Irelia, like Jax, um, those types of champs. Um, so, you know, and then that gets into, you know, well, where do they fit? Are they supposed to be tanks? Are they supposed to be assassins? Um, so I think there can be gray area between all of these things. And I think there's, you know, a lot of a lot of counterplay. And then there's, you got your siege champions who are good at taking objectives and, and things like that. And your sort of debuffers, your support champions. Um, but I think that just in general, there's just too much damage right now, and too much damage means there's too little counterplay. You don't have time to use your abilities. You don't have time to interact. You don't have time to play the game that you want to play. So it's really fun for the assassins, right? It's really fun um, for them to come up and one-shot you, right? You're like, yeah, I just did it. I one-shot them. Sometimes it's fun to watch, right? If you're watching an eSport game, sometimes it's fun to watch, right? Where you're just like, oh, you know... That person just played this assassin or whatever and just completely deleted this person. But after a while, it gets old, right? Even people who would spectate or watch this, they would be like, well, because then you know the game's over. There's inevitability because there's not counterplay. And you're like, okay, well, Talon's 3-0 and or 4-0 and or whatever. Game's over, basically. And I'm not one of those people, but realistically, sometimes it is. <laughs> In the vast majority of games, when you don't have catch-up mechanics, when it's all about assassins that can literally just come up in one shot with very little counterplay because tanks have been run out of the meta right scissors always wins now <laughs> it always beats the paper thin squishy champions there is no rock to counter it right now in the meta or there aren't many rocks there are a couple but there aren't many so i think that's problematic but anyways so this is these are some of the things that i think are going on right now in the meta and we'll kind of speed up here i really don't want this video to be like super long um, as I always say, but we'll try to keep it, see if we can keep it like 45 minutes. So that's the overall problem right now in the meta. I hope that they dial back the damage a little bit, um, and help the bot lane out, but this next patch is not going to help the bot lane out. It's definitely going to make it a bit weaker. So let's talk about that first. Let's talk about some of these, um, support changes. So I have like three sections here. We're going to do support changes. I'll focus mostly on that because most of the audience on my channel are support players. So I'll focus on that a lot. Then we'll talk about the bruisers a little bit. Then we'll talk about some of the other just kind of random buffs they have in there. Okay, so overall, what they're doing on this patch is they are specifically targeting shields, and they're saying that they might make other adjustments to supports as well in the near future. Okay, so the basic gist of it, if you look at Surrender at 20 here, is they are shaving off about 20% of the plus healing and shielding stat off of most items, right? So Redemption and Ardent Sensor are losing 2% plus healing and shielding. Mikhail's Crucible is losing 5 so it's actually using 25% instead of 20%. Um, 
And then they're changing the way that they are buffing Athenes, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. I think this is actually a really cool item. I think this is this is one of the healthier uh, support items, so I, I like this change. Um, and then with several other supports, they're lowering the shield duration to two and a half seconds. So with Lulu, they're lowering the shield duration. Now it's important to note that Pix still stays on the person for six seconds with Lulu, okay? So this is one of the things that I heard I'm a cutie pie complaining about is that Lulu, you just put the picks on somebody and buff them up with W and they just blow everyone up. That's still going to be a possibility. Um, and Lulu a lot of times doesn't max her shield. She'll max her W for team fighting, so she'll get like two to three points of shield in lane and then go team fighting. So I think Lulu's not as bad off as some other people like Janna. Um, Janna's getting hit particularly hard. So let's just look at some of the individuals here. Okay, so Lulu, two and a half seconds. The main function of that shield a lot of times is to put picks on somebody, though, so that's probably okay. I mean, it's a nerf, but I think she's one of the better off people for that. Um, they're lowering Karma's shield down to two and a half seconds. Karma already has a big problem, and her shield is a lot weaker than others. So I don't really like this one. Um, just because her shield base is like 190, I think. And Janice and Lulu, they are both um, 200, or they're both 210. So, I don't know. I know they're trying to uniform and, like, do this across the board, but I, I think they could have let Karma get away with a slightly bigger shield. But, I mean, a lot of that's for Karma mid lane, though, which has been picking up steam in the professional circles. So, that, that's fair, I guess. And then Janna. Now, this is one that I'm a little worried about because... Now, they might change this as well. So, this is still has 5 seconds, but it decays over 5 seconds. So, they might just be testing this on the PvE. Well, what if we give them the long shield and then let it decay over time versus what if we give the 2.5 second shield? I do not like the decay mechanic on a shield because I don't really understand sort of what that means. Like, how much does it decay over time? Um, when does the decay start? Does the decay include shield that has already been eaten through? So if you give somebody a 210 shield and they instantly, you know, the enemy instantly breaks like 100 of it, does it still start decaying? Or does it keep in mind that it's already lost 100 and it's not going to decay lower than it's 50% of its value until a certain point? I just don't know. Like, this is just a lot more difficult to understand and to analyze statistically what that decay means. Um... So, as someone who does a lot of kind of math and analytical stuff, I, I don't like that because it, it, it's rough. I don't mind the two and a half seconds, though. So, like, here's the thing about shields. A lot of people hate them. Like, that, that's the first thing to understand is a lot of people ab who don't play support absolutely hate Janna. And, I mean, they asked, uh, so on one of the newest uh, Beyond the Rifts, they had I Will Dominate on there. I think that was, like, maybe a, a couple of weeks ago. That it was I Will Dominate, um, Skara, and I'm a Cutie Pie, and they were discussing shield champions, and they were discussing other stuff, and they, they asked, if there was one champion in the game that you could delete, which champion would it be and why, for balance reasons? And I will dominate, said Janna. So of all like 144 champions, this he wanted Janna gone. And everybody agreed that they hated Janna. They absolutely hated Janna. Now other people said other things. I think that um, somebody said Zoe. Uh, I think I will... Um, I'm a cutie pie, said Rakan. And I think Scara might have said Zoe. So that's two enchanters out of the three people. If they could ban any champion, just perma ban any champion in League of Legends, both of them chose two enchanters. So why is that? Why do people hate enchanters? Well, a lot of people view enchanters as anti-fun stat sticks. This is a conversation over and over again that, that they talked about. And to some extent, that's true. And they've tried to remove that over time. So uh, Riot has called this invisible power, and supports are... The, mo the largest offenders of invisible power because people don't understand why they're good. So like Janna, for example, everyone thinks that she's just this brain dead, stupid champion that no one can ever win with and you have to you have to play Zyra or Bran to win games. And yet Janna historically almost always has the highest win percentage of supports or she's almost always in the top five. I think she's fallen out of that recently because the meta is so fast and her shield's on an 18 second cooldown early on. Um... 
But yeah, I think um, part of the problem is it's invisible power. People don't understand just how much damage her shield does, right? Because it gives 40 AD, which is a lot. Now, they nerfed Critical Strike Champions, which hurts Janna a lot. A lot more than people think. And I mentioned this in my patch notes video, and no other commentator has mentioned this. But the 40 AD multiplies off a of crit. And specifically multiplies off of Infinity Edge as well. So if you give, you know, if that Caitlyn, you know, in patch 8.10, so before this patch, before the Infinity Edge change, if you gave that Caitlyn an extra 40 AD off of the Janna shield, and she auto-attacked and crit somebody... Um, not including headshots and all that, then that 40 AD all of a sudden becomes 100 extra damage, right? So if she has a 40% crit chance, I've done this math before, I can't remember it. I, I think you'll land two. If it's five seconds, she gets off five auto attacks in five seconds. Um, then two of those are going to crit. So that's going to be um, 100 damage each because it's doubled and then you get the extra... Um, 50% uh, crit damage, right? And so it used to be 250% damage on an auto attack with someone who had Infinity Edge. So that would give you 250% of 40, and that's how I get to 100, right? So that would do 100 damage twice. So that's 200 damage, and you have three more auto attacks at 40 apiece that don't crit. Um, and so that's 320 damage. And so that's why Janna's shield was strong, right? That's a big part of it that is hidden power that people don't understand. Right, they think Janna doesn't do any damage. She does a lot of damage. She just doesn't get credit for it. Right, the AD carry gets credit for that damage. Right, and so that's the thing. If you told somebody, if you broke it down for them like this, and I did this in my Janna guide, be sure to check it out. It's a great guide. Um, you know, if you said you could just point click, and this is before they um, nerfed Janna's shield, also. But if you could point click, if you had, you know, X amount of AP, and if you had like Ardent Sensor, I don't remember the exact things that I did. But if you had like plus 20% heal and shield, and then you had, you know, like 60 AP, you know, back in the day or whatever, you'd get somewhere in the neighborhood of a 300 shield and 320 damage on a point click ability that has a 10 second cooldown. That's really big, right? That is really big. I mean, 320 damage on a point click instant cast spell, basically. That's like an ultimate for a lot of champions, how much damage, and it shields them, and it blocks 300 damage. So that's why Janna's really strong. So, But a lot of that is just stats. It's just understanding stats and math and just putting a bunch of items on her that give her good stats, right? Because her shield is a lot of her power. It's so strong from that 40 AD, but that gets a lot worse without crit champions because now... You know, if somebody crits, it's just going to be 80 damage instead of 100 damage. And people aren't going to be building crit as much anymore anyways. And so if you put this shield on somebody like a Kai'Sa, who's going to build almost no crit, um, then it's just going to be 40 damage per hit. Now, the extra attack speed does give it extra modifiers as well, too, right? Um, so that's going to allow you to attack more than just five times in five seconds. But it's not. It's still not going to be quite as strong as Critical Strike is, especially when it comes to upfront burst damage. So she took a hit there. Um, she took a huge hit when they nerfed her shield cooldown early from 10 seconds to 18 seconds. It's so easy to trade against her now. Um, but that's why, is a lot of people don't understand it. They think it's very easy. It's just a point click. And to some extent, it's easy to be like effective as Janna. It is harder to master her. But it's easy to be very effective. She has a very high floor, right? So it's difficult to be a really bad Janna because at the end of the day, you can still just point click that shield. Even if you screw up the tornadoes, even if you screw up the ult, you can still point click the shield and she's very safe because of her tornado, her ult, her W, all that stuff. So she's super safe, super effective, and she scales ridiculously well with AP and the plus healing shielding stats. So she's just a huge stat stick. Um... And they think that it's just too easy to have a high impact with very little skill expression, right? So there is a big difference in a, a great Janna and an okay Janna because a great Janna is going to interrupt um, movement with her Tornado and with her ultimate, right? So if Zach's trying to engage or if Lee Sen's trying to engage, you know, with his Q, then um, you could just use your Tornado, knock him out of the air. You could use your ult to knock him out of the air. And so she does have these really cool interactions where you can, you know, demonstrate skill, right? Where you can peel people off. And that's good, and that's powerful. But overall, it's the plus healing and shielding um, 
that's problematic. And I think that, like, Lulu's also guilty of this to an extent, right? Where she just puts her shield on somebody with picks. She can put her W on them, grab Ardent Sensor on a Kog'Maw or something, and they just obliterate the whole team, right? And so that's just, it's too many stats. And it is. It's a lot of stats. It's powerful. I talked about this before in a Lulu guide, so be sure to watch that on the channel. But, um, and many of my support tier lists, you know, Lulu putting picks on somebody and all this, you know, and loading them up with whimsy, uh, it does generate multi-thousand gold worth of value, right? I mean, we're talking like, it was like 14 kills worth of value if you have a maxed out um, shield and a maxed out whimsy that you put on somebody. It's just insane value. So they're not wrong here. They're not wrong that a lot of supports are too strong with plus healing shielding. And keep in mind, this, this starves out other types of supports, right? So this is why a lot of times, you know, the people who like to play damage supports at higher than gold it doesn't work because they get out scaled really hard if they don't snowball and it's harder to snowball on plat plus people now there are a lot of turkeys in platinum but it, it's nevertheless harder i'll tell you it is because earlier on in the season you know when we got placed into gold and we were trying to work our way out of that for a month or two i don't remember how long it, i played zyra all the time because it's just much easier to hit your skill shots in gold and to get ahead early and then snowball that later so the AP supports are really good at snowballing, but if they fall behind, you know, if that Janna manages to get Redemption Locket McHale's or something, you're not killing anybody anymore in the mid game, right? And so it does starve out these other types of supports that people like to play. You know, pe there are a lot of people that would love to play Zyra more. They'd like to play Bran. They'd like to play Lux. I know that Talith on the channel loves Lux, and there's all kinds of other people like Lux support. Enchanters are the fun police for these champions right there are people on the channel that really like to play braum or really like to play Tarek, or you know these other like peeler support tank type of champions and janna's the fun police on that right because you've always got to say well what happens when janna gets three items and it's not just janna it could be janna it could be lulu it could be sona any of these high scaling stat stick type of supports um just starve out other options in the support role because they're just too good they're too powerful and that's why for you know it's starting to change now but for the last um maybe the last five patches or so then it's been like the top six champions in solo queue have all been enchanters um so that's changing a little bit, but you'll see, you know, anything that has more than like a 0.1 representation is still going to be mostly Enchanter. So if we look at the top 10 here, and I'm not going to follow Bear out of it, I'm not counting it. He's only played in like 0.1% of games. But if we look at this, you know, just win rate wise, we have one, I'm counting Tarek as an Enchanter because a lot of times he'll get at least one or two Enchanter items, but you can count him as Tank if you want, whatever. I'm, we'll count him as Enchanter and Tank. How about that? So we'll do one, two, three, four. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so stop at Soraka. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. At least six enchanters, and depending on what how you want to consider Zillion, up to seven enchanters. Right? And then we have um, three AP champions and one kind of tank that's not diversity right that's six or seven enchanters two ap champions and um two possibly three if you want to count or um three possibly four ap champions if you want to count zillion as ap i'm not counting morgana as ap um ap champions so you've got three or four ap champions they're starting to come back a little bit so it's starting to get more balanced right um and then you've got uh like one kind of tank and you know if you look just a couple of slots down you, it's even more enchanter so almost every enchanter is at least 50 percent, and then all of the tanks are under 50 percent, right and then some of the ap champs are definitely coming up a little bit now so that's starting to balance its way out a little bit but that's because enchanters are the fun police right because they just are going to scale a lot harder because of their items than other types of supports. So Riot is correct to want to change enchanters. Right? However, so I think this patch is okay. 
I think it'll be an okay nerf for most enchanters. I'm a little worried about the Janus Shield Decay. I'm not sure what that means. But I think for like Lulu, um, Sona wasn't mentioned in this. Soraka is not changed in this. So the healers aren't changed. Another thing about shields in particular that are problematic is um, they get around Grievous Wounds and they scale with resistances. And that's something that a lot of people forget, right? Is that, a th a, you know, a 300 shield is not just a 300 shield. So if somebody has um, a 300 shield and they have 100 armor and they're getting hit by something that's physical, it's going to take 600 damage to break that 300 shield, right? People forget that because each point of armor requires 1% extra of that type of damage to um cut through that armor right so if someone has 100 armor then it's going to take an extra you know 100 damage so here's here's how it works so you have 100 plus um or 100 you do 100 divided by 100 plus the amount of armor that you have and that's the damage reduction so 100 we have 100 armor so 100 plus the armor Divided by 200 takes us to 50%. So you're only going to do 50% damage to somebody who has 100 armor. So if you have a 300 shield, if you do 300 damage, that's only going to do 150 total damage. So you have to do 600 damage in order after the reduction of 50% to do that 300 to break the shield. Does that make sense? So armor applies to shields. So that's what make that is part of what makes them really toxic is they get around grievous wounds, and they um, and they give you uh, and, and they have the the armor and magic resist also apply to them, and some of the best shields also give additional stat bonuses right so particularly like Janna, that's who I'm thinking of there so um, that that is the major issue there so I have suggested in the past just make shields take full damage. Right, so just everything does true damage to shields and just make the shields a little bit bigger or balance it around that way. That's how it is in most games, right? Like shields don't get the benefit of armor and it doesn't even make any sense. Why would like the armor that you're wearing affect the shield that's around you? Usually, like if you want to buff your shields, you have to get some other type of stat to do that. So thinking of something like Starcraft, for example, with Protoss, there's a separate upgrade for upgrading your armor and upgrading your shields. They're um, different things. And there's a lot of games that are like that, where shields are considered something different than armor. But that's not the route they're taking with this. I think ultimately that's what they would need to do to balance out shields. So what they're going to try to do is say, okay, shields are super powerful, but only for a very small window of time. The problem is a lot of shields um, get broken pretty early. And one of the more degenerate things also is that a lot of shields are used for non-shielding things. So with Janna, for example, you just throw a shield on Janna half the time on the back line where people don't even break it just to get the extra AD, right? So just so they get that extra 40 AD on your AD carry while they're auto attacking, um, then they that that's why you do it or you just need to take a tower okay just put the shield on somebody and then they do a bunch of extra ad that might be why they're changing janna around so that if you want to just put the shield on the ad carry then it still lasts for five seconds and it just decays over time so that that actually kind of makes sense because the thing about janna she has that 80 on her shield so if you reduce the time to 2.5 seconds you're reducing her damage by 50 percent on that shield um so that's that might be why they're doing that so i guess that kind of makes sense so they want it to be these like smaller windows of power on the shield where there's more counterplay to it. And I like that. Personally, I would probably just get rid of the stat plus healing and shielding in all honesty and just balance around. Like, Janna was still played a lot. Like, Lulu was still relevant, you know, in Season 6 before they introduced the stat plus healing and shielding. Because um, that... The thing about plus healing and shielding, people also don't realize, and I've just I've just described this in a lot of videos as well, is that scales multiplicatively with um, AP, right? And so let's let's look at Janna here, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The problem is these stats compound, and they get even more powerful. So if you get something like Let's say you get Ardent Sensor on Janna. Really, really simple example. Okay, so Ardent Sensor has 60 AP on it. So you get 0.7 ratio on this. 
right? And so if we do uh, 60 times 0.7 equals 42. Okay, we're going to add that on to 210. Okay, you add that on first. That's 252. All right. Now you get the plus 10% plus healing and shielding off of Ardent Sensor before it gets nerfed to 8%. We'll just say um, times 1.1 equals 277. So when it says you get plus 10% plus healing and shielding, that's not on the base number, the 210. That's after AP applies. So instead of giving you 21, it gives you closer to 25 extra um, effective shield. And so that's why it starts getting so crazy once you get a ton of items that you know give you both AP and plus healing and shielding. This is what makes Ardent Sensor so good is because it gets the double scaling on these types of champions because it gives them the AP and it gives them the plus healing and shielding. And then once you get things like Redemption, the plus healing and shielding also applies to Redemption Shields. So if you have, if you it applies triple to Redemption Shields. So if you have that, then it gets even bigger, right? And then that also has plus healing and shielding, which funnels back to help out this one, right? To help out Eye of the Storm. And then like Mikhail's gives you really good utility and then plus 20% plus healing and shielding, which beefs up redemption a lot and beefs up your Eye of the Storm. And so that's kind of, they just, they scale so well with each other and no other class of support items scale like that, right? That are this cheap also, all of those items the uh, Mikhail's and Redemption are 2100 and Ardent Sensor's 2300. We'll talk about this, the economy here in just a second. Um, well, I guess it's going to be about an hour long. Um, but I think it's important that people understand like what the actual problem with support is and then what the actual solution to support could be. Right? Um, so this is the issue, is that it, it's the stats are too big on plus healing and shielding. Like, Braum doesn't have anything anywhere close to that. As far as stats, like he has a good shield. Just using Braum as an example of like a pretty well balanced, like good, um, competitive, you know, tank support. Right? He doesn't have anything like that. Like what he gets Knight's Vow. Okay, what does Knight's Vow scale with? Locket, I guess. But they nerfed Locket so much that it doesn't even have that much scaling with Locket anymore. Um, so you can just get these kind of like disparate items that just don't scale well with each other. You can get like Zeke's and then Knight's Vow, and they just don't have a lot of synergy with each other. Or if you're Thresh, like what do you buy on Thresh these days? You know, I guess you could get like either Shirelia's or Righteous Glory if you wanted more engage. Um, you can get Knight's Vow, but it's going to be half as effective on him. You can get Zeke's, but there's just there's no scaling on these items. The same way that to the same extent that plus healing and shielding is. So that's the problem, is that like a lot of these cool champions that are fun, that people want to try to play, you know, someone like Zyra does have scaling, right? But it's very expensive scaling. You have to get Leandre's plus Rylai's and then plus Void Staff after that. That's kind of the triple combo. But that's so expensive. If you're thinking about, you know, trying to get to Leandre's, that's 3,100 plus Rylai's, I believe is 2,650? Might be 2,700. Plus Void Staff is like 2700 Might be 2750 Is 8500 gold for those three items to scale. Right? Whereas the um, the Redemption, Mikhail's, Ardent Sensor is only 6500 So it's going to cost you, you know, almost a third more. Probably a little bit more than a third more to buy these. The game's going to be over before you get this amount of gold to support. So that's the issue is that enchanters that shielding is very strong in and of itself because of the way that it scales with resistances and it doesn't have any sort of counterplay from grievous wounds um and just the, the raw stats and scaling in combination of ap with the stat plus healing and shielding just makes enchanters that have shields and to some extent heals um just really difficult to outscale later on in the game so it doesn't matter how fancy your thresh hooks are. It doesn't matter how, you know, how good some of your Zyra roots are and things like that. A lot of times, if that, uh, you know, if that Janna or Sona or Soraka gets the three items, they're just going to cancel everything that you do. And a lot of those are just point-click abilities that are on your allies versus the other stuff, the offensive stuff 
is often skill shots or something that puts you in significant danger. If you try to go in with Alistar and your team doesn't follow up, you're going to die. Right? So it's very risky to go in, whereas just throwing a shield on somebody with Janna from like 800 units away, that's not risky. <laughs> right? Um, so that's the thing is there's just, it's, there's such safety in picking something like an enchanter. Um, it's very safe and it scales super well. And then the question becomes, well, why on earth would you play something if you're trying to win that's way more dangerous, that's not going to scale as well, you know? And so that's, that's one of the major, uh, that's one of the major issues there. So I agree that support has problems, especially plus healing and shielding type of supports. And how do you balance that out fairly? What my concerns are, are that people are overestimating support role in general. Like all of the, um, all of the people on Beyond the Rift with uh, Scar and I'm a Cutie Pie and just other programs that I've seen as well. And you've heard Apdo say this before, who's a really good uh, Korean solo queue player and a bunch of other people. The supports are too strong. They're too powerful. Um, and all that stuff. And I just don't think that's true. I think there's a certain subset of supports. There are some problematic supports like Janna that are, that have the potential structurally to be too powerful for the reasons I described. But that's not all supports. Like, I don't think Thresh is too powerful right now, for example. Because um, you got to keep in mind, supports make less gold than anyone else. This has been a complaint that I've heard a lot of people say is, well, supports are making a ton of gold. You know, they're making all this crazy gold everywhere. No, they're not. <laughs> Right? They still make less gold than everyone else in the game. Um, so if you just look at some of my games, I've been on a terrible loss streak for a few days here, so it's going to look bad. But anyways, if we just look at some of these games, um, I have 12k gold in this game. Right? I mean, even like our Zin Zhao, which, you know, bless his heart, Visualizer was trying. It was a tough game. He's one in five. He's the jungler. Um, I actually did more damage than he did this game. Right? I did more damage. I have... Uh, we both have one kill. I have 23 assists. He has five. So I have 18 more assists than he does. Um, and yet, I still have less gold. I still have 1,000 1, less gold. What? What? So people are telling me I haven't earned that. Like, I have way more assists. Um, I'm doing good support things, right? I dropped a lot of wards. I have way more wards. I have nine control wards, more than anyone on their team. So I'm warding. I'm rotating. I'm getting, like, really high kill participation, right? I mean, I have 83% kill participation. 83%. So I'm doing like awesome support things. No one's even close to 83 kill participation. I was everywhere. I was in every play in this game. I'm warding a lot. I'm in every play. I'm buying the correct items. I'm not dying too much, right? Like I'm dying uh, less than the average on my team. Um, huge kill participation. Warding a lot. Doing like kind of okay damage, you know? And I still make less gold. How am I making too much gold? Like, I'm not saying that I want to be showered with gold for doing support things, but I'm just saying, look, I'm performing well on my role. Why shouldn't I get at least at, at least somewhere close to the same amount of gold as someone else who's underperforming in a real lane, right? In a, a lane that gets CS. Even if you look at, like, a carry game like this. Let me see. I don't know what my gold will look. I haven't looked at these, so maybe the gold will be different. No. No. Look at this. Even on a champion like Pike. Now, I didn't I didn't do that well this game. Obviously, my kill participation is down on this one. You know, I was only 4-4-7, four, four, and seven, so I wasn't doing as well in this one. But, um, you know, I'm still making a lot less gold. Even on someone like Pike, where I'm actively trying to get the kills and distribute that gold to other people, um, still making less gold. If you look at, like, most of these games, right, like this solo queue game, Doing good support things, right? Have a pretty reasonable kill participation compared to my team. We're close. You know, I had 21 assists. Um, you know, buying a lot of control wards, placing a lot of wards, killing wards, doing my support thing. I have, you know, 20% less gold than... This guy had 13 deaths. 
This guy at one point in the game was 1 in 10. He has 13 deaths, only 8 assists, and still I have 20% less gold than this guy. So I don't want to hear it. People out there saying that supports, they make too much money. No, even if you're doing a really like a really good job as support, you're making a lot less money. So how does that work then? Why is that fair? The only reason that it's fair is because support items are cheap. This is why support items are cheap. Because even if you are a good support, even if you're doing good support things, right? You have good kill participation. You're keeping your deaths fairly low. I had seven in that recon game. That's unacceptable. <laughs> That's too many. But like, even if you do good support things, right? However people want to define good support things, right? Which is usually like vision, objectives, assists, kill participation, peeling, you know, all of this stuff, you're still going to have a lot less gold than anyone else on your team. And the way that that's okay is your items are cheaper, right? So your items, good items on support are somewhere between 2,100 to 2,400 gold. So if we look at, um, you know, like a standard item for other roles that might be good, um, I don't know what the average item... I mean, maybe it would say like 2,900 gold. Um, so let's do... Let's say uh, a support item. We call it like 2,300 gold. Divided by 2,900. That's... You're saving about 21%. Right? So support items are about 21% cheaper than their non-support counterparts. That's if you're buying the appropriate support items, right? So that's if you're buying things like Ardent Sensor, like Knight's Vow, like Zeke's, um, you know, stuff like that, then um, you're getting this discount, the 2,900 gold. But you're also making 20% less gold, as we just saw in that one Recon game and Ranked. So that seems fair to me. You're doing your role, you're doing it very well, you are making 20% less gold than other people on your team, so therefore your items cost 20% less so that you can keep up with them and have you know good skill expression in the game. What's unfair about that? Sounds fair to me. Um, so that that's why. And they want supports to be able to buy items and have what they're calling kind of the support fantasy where you have lots of options, you get items, and you get to do things to express skill in the game. This is something people complain about. Right? This is what a lot of people like, I, I'm a cutie pie, I will dominate. This is what people complain about. Oh, support's brain dead, they don't have enough stuff. One of the major ways that you can express power is through good item actives. And Riot has tried to do that recently with the introduction of things like redemption, um, to a lesser extent, like locket. Like they're trying to make all these items that historically, like locket used to be an aura item, it was a sort of invisible power, you just bought it, it just worked. Right, But I think Redemption is the perfect example of a super powerful item active that has a very clear fail case where people run out of it and it does nothing and it's really bad. And it also has the really good case where if you aim it correctly and communicate it to your team, it can completely turn a fight around. So I think Redemption is awesome in that sense, that it rewards you for skillful play, good communication and coordination with your team. Powerful, good item. You don't want to make supports go back to Season 1 or Season 2 where you don't give them enough gold to keep up with anybody anymore and all they do is buy wards. I didn't mind that meta, but then the only way that they have real power is just to make all of their abilities really overpowered in terms of stat sticks. So that is that is the era where Janna would have like a 300 shield and all of this other crazy stuff because they had to have that. So it depends on your design philosophy. So basically you can either, if you want supports to be meaningful and solo queue, which you need them to be, or otherwise the queues are going to be like 30 minutes long because nobody wants to play support. It's already the least played role. So they want support to be fun. They want it to be sexy, right? They want people to want to play support. So if your design philosophy is, well, we're going to starve their economy, the only way you can make it interesting then is to make their abilities stat sticks to overcompensate for that it's like well they can't buy items that give them stats because all the items are too expensive so they have to just have really high base stats everywhere but that's no fun because you don't get options with that you just have stats in your kit right it's more fun to be able to choose okay do i really want athenes here or do i want redemption here or do i need to get locket here like items are choices like they let you differentiate 
different game states and choose, you know, that's a, that's a part of the skill of the game is choosing items and deciding what your team needs and, you know, sort of crafting your, your path to victory through your items. And so, because this has been, I'm mentioning this because this is one critique that people have said is the supports make too much gold and their items are too cheap. And I think that's false. I think they make the right amount of gold, which is 20% less a lot of times than their counterparts, even if they play better than their counterparts, better, right? Even if they die less and they do their job very well, they still make 20% less gold most of the time. And so their items should be 20 to 25% cheaper, depending on what's going on. So you have to remember, they have to buy a lot of wards too. So it's not just that you know, they make all of this extra gold, but also they have to spend a lot of gold on things like wards. Um, and so that that's an extra tax, right? So if you're buying, you know, 10 control wards in a game, that's 750 gold that you have to buy right there. Now, yes, if you're clearing wards, you're going to get some of that refunded, but because the burden of vision is on you, that's an extra tax, you know, on your economy. So anyways, this is something that I'm worried about. I'm worried that People think that they make too much gold. Another thing to keep in mind is that supports are often underleveled. So this means that you're missing multi-thousand gold worth of stats. I've mentioned this earlier. You know, when the Fizz mid lane is level 12 and you're level 9 to support, he's going to obliterate you if he finds you out. Even if you're a damage-dealing support, he's going to have so much extra magic resist and health, you're not going to be able to kill him most of the time, even if you catch him. And so... I think that's a huge problem. I think that if you have the support item, you should get a bonus. You should get more experience for doing support things. So I would like to see it with Vision, where if you get a kill or an assist on a ward, you get extra experience. You get some, but I want them to bump that up even more so that if you're actively finding wards and locking out enemy vision, if you're doing good support stuff, then you're actually getting experience for it. Because one of the big problems why you fall behind in experience is if you leave the lane to go ward or to clear ward, you're missing experience in that lane and you're falling further and further behind. So not only are you sharing experience with somebody, but you're also falling behind because you have to go do these other things. Or if you're roaming to try to make a play mid, you know, while you're moving up and down that river, you're losing experience. So that's what I would like to see is either you get extra, if you have the support item and the quest completed, then you get extra gold or experience for killing wards and you get extra stuff for uh, maybe for assists uh, something like that to help keep you in the game a little bit more the other alternative is they could just increase shared gold so right now i think you get 130 percent so if something gives 100 experience then um, both you and the adc would each get 65 so that would go to 130 experience total and then you split it 50 50 i mean they could change that to something like 150 percent so that each one of you would get 75 experience that would make the 80 carries level a little bit faster, which, to be honest, I think would be fair because the 80 carries are under level two. You know, so where you're level nine and that Fizz is level 12, the 80 carries probably level 10. Unless they're really popping off, they might be level 11 if they have a couple of kills. Um, but they're still going to be under leveled compared to definitely the mid lane and top lane and oftentimes the jungler too. So. I would do something like that, but I think supports in particular need that extra love because they get penalized for doing what they should be doing, which is, you know, uh, generating vision and trying to make plays around the map. So I think that would be cool. And that would also make it more viable to roam. I talked about this in the last video that I made, like what to do when your AD carry fails bottom. And a lot of people think that it's roam all the time, but a lot of times it's not. And part of that is because you're losing a lot of experience to take a risk, right? So you're leaving your lane, you're losing a ton of experience um, in order to try to make a play mid. And that's different than jungler because the jungler is oftentimes waiting on their camps to respawn in the jungle anyways while they're doing that. So they're not losing any potential experience. They wouldn't get experience anyways. They would just be sitting in their jungle waiting on a camp to spawn. So they're not losing any of their potential experience by trying to make a gank someplace a lot of times right now in the jungle. Like I said, I wish they would change that. I wish they would be losing potential experience, but right now it's just not the case. And so that's different from support. So ganking as a jungler or camping a lane is is a lot less damaging than trying to roam as support because roaming as support, there's always experience in the lane rolling up. And so whenever you leave to go do anything, whether it's ward or roam or whatever, you're losing experience. Now, yeah, you are going to get a little bit, you know, as you go into the mid lane, 
and make a play, you're going to get some experience from creeps dying around you, but you're still losing experience while you're running between lanes. So that's what I would say. And a thing also is a lot of these really good support items require interaction. So it requires your partner to actually do something meaningful. So like with redemption, if people step outside of redemption, um, then it fails and you don't do anything, right? Um, if you put Zeke's on somebody and you cast your ult and go in and your AD carry runs away and doesn't use it, it doesn't work. Whereas a lot of these um, like solo lane items, you know, like Titanic Hydra, you control how that works all the time. Like you can auto attack, reset, you do whatever you want. When you're an AD carry, if you buy Gensu's Rage Blade, it always works at full capacity, right? So it's up to you. You control it, how often you auto attack and stack it and all that stuff. Essence Reaver just works. But a lot of these support actives, if you have a turkey that you're partnered with or that you're trying to do something with, it becomes a lot less efficient if they don't utilize it correctly. And the same is true of a lot of support spells, right, and abilities. If you hit, if you hit a Thresh Hook and you go in... Um, and no one follows you, then you're probably going to die, and it's going to look bad. If you go in with Alistar, nobody follows you, looks bad. Um, <clears throat> you use your Terracol, and your team runs away, it looks bad. So that's the thing, is these are all reasons why I don't think that support is overpowered. They make a lot less gold than anybody else, they're always underleveled, and a lot of their stuff requires interaction. So if Something crazy is going on down there. I think my wife's like yelling with the baby. Um, anyways, so that that's the thing that keeps it in line is it requires a lot more interaction, I think, than other roles. And even if you don't agree with that, um, you know, in other words, I think the support is one of the roles that is worse when your team is bad than other roles, right? So that makes it kind of harder to carry to some extent. But when your team is like, okay, you can be the glue that holds them all together and makes it win. So it's like you are a multiplier on your team. If your team's doing all right, then you add a huge amount of extra power to your team. If your team's doing bad though, underperforming, then your multiplier is gonna be a lot less, if that kind of makes sense. So anyways, I don't think support's overpowered. I think it's fine for the reasons we described. We're already over an hour and seven. But I just want to, I don't know. I, I got kind of deep in the tank here, but I think it's, I think people misunderstand support a lot of the time. So wh what would I like to see happen? Um, I think lowering the plus healing and shielding would add some nice, um, does help lower kind of the stat stick problem. And if you make shields less powerful than champions like Thresh, Rakan, Bard, all of these become a lot more powerful because then you don't have Janna as the fun police anymore, right? So people ask me, well, what about Bard? Why isn't Bard higher? Or what about Thresh? You know, and the reason is they just don't scale. As I said before, once Janna gets three items, a lot of times it doesn't even matter if you hit the hook. It doesn't matter if you land a Bard ult or whatever because just the raw stats just crush you <laughs> late game. And they can't miss that. Like there's, there's very little room for error when you're sitting there spamming, like, Sona Ws, or when you, you know, um, drop a Redemption and press R on Janna, like, it's hard to mess that up, right? Whereas you can miss a lot of thresholds, you can miss Bard ults. And so, I think trying to emphasize some of these playmaking supports a little bit more is ultimately good, because a lot of people respect these champions, right? A lot of people say, wow, that Thresh was pretty good, I got outplayed. Or, wow, that Bard's pretty good, I got outplayed. Very few people will say things like, man, that Soraka outplayed me. Or, man, that Janna outplayed me. You know, on this channel, we can recognize good Janna and Soraka play. But I'm talking about, you know, the general population just does not respect those champions as much as these champions. And if these champions are cool, if they're fun, if they look exciting, if they actually have a chance, more people would be willing to play support, right? More people who aren't support mains would be willing to give it a try if Thresh was a little bit more viable, right? Or if they could play Bard, and Bard was a little bit more viable. Or Lux, if Lux was a bit more viable. They would actually like to play support more. Um, and But a lot of people aren't going to want to play support and play Janna. Or they aren't going to want to play Soraka, unfortunately. You know, support mains are going to like those champs, probably. But we need people that aren't just support mains to play support. Riot, Riot needs that as a game, so that queue times stay reasonable. 
And if they do that, then they can add in more fun stuff in the future. So I do like lowering some of these stats, particularly plus healing and shielding. Um, but it doesn't fix a lot of the problems also. Um, you know, I think that overall what they need to do is take redemption as an example and add a lot more skill expression to items and to abilities. So have clear fail cases. Make it possible to mess up as support. So this redemption is a great example of this because it can miss. So it can be really good or it can be really bad, depending on what's going on. So make more items like this. Um, Zeke's is also kind of a good template, right? Where if you use your ult, there's a certain window of time where your AD carry can get all of this power and where you get all of this kind of peeling power as well. I think Zeke's is 10 seconds. I think that's probably a bit long. Um... I think they should probably lower that to about 5 seconds. If they need to increase the power, so be it. Um, 10 seconds. Yeah, I think that's a bit I think that's a bit long. But I like the idea where it's a very limited time power spike that you really have to take advantage of. If you don't do it in this limited window of time, the enemy has lots of counterplay. So if you screw up, your Zeke's engage and your team doesn't follow up immediately then they know they're going to have like at least one minute where they can punish you while it's on cooldown. So I like that. I think that there should be more internal cooldowns on items and they should have really clear moments of power, moments of skill expression. But if you screw it up, you should have to pay the penalty. You should be very vulnerable um, for an extended period of time. So I think they should take this down something, seven seconds, maybe even five seconds. Um in a fight. I think anything, any, a buffs that last longer than five seconds, you can't wait them out and you can't counterplay them. So this way, even if, like, even if Rakan goes in and your AD carry's not ready or they're not even there, sometimes they show up, like, four seconds late, this still would activate on them if they come into range of it, even if they weren't there for the initial um, burst of it. And they would still get the buff. So. But I like the idea. So I think that Zeke's and, um... Redemption are good templates. So now they just need to do this with other items. So maybe Knight's Vow. Put it on like a 30 second cooldown. A low cooldown so you can change partners. And then just make it to where you can activate it. And it only lasts for like 5 seconds, right? So that's where you get this partnered buff. So then you can engage. You know, you activate it. And then your AD carry, you know, gives you all this extra lifesteal. You give all this extra mitigation. But it only lasts for 5 seconds. But it has a much lower cooldown. Instead of two minutes, you can do this now every 30 seconds or so. So that means you get it once per fight, but it's going to be up almost every fight. But if, if you don't do it correctly, if you don't close out the fight quickly, then you're not going to have it, and it's going to be a really weak item overall. So just give it these small windows of power more often. So it's skill expression. Did I do this correctly? Or you could take it even in another direction and say... To differentiate it even more, just say something like Knight's Vow, make it only last like two seconds, but like double the effectiveness. You know, say something like, okay, it's going to block 25% of the damage for two seconds. So if you do it really quickly, then it blocks a lot of damage. But if you do it at the wrong time, then it doesn't do anything. Hardly, right? So this is kind of like the philosophy of something like a Fiora Riposte, or Riposte, as people say, for example, where you have the second and a half, it like blocks all damage and returns this fire to them. And that's a really cool moment with Fiora, right? Where it's, that distinguishes good Fioras from bad Fioras. Like, dang it, she just, you know, reposted my exhaust. Or she just reposted, like, this Karthus ult or this crazy ability. I think that's fun. That's outplay, right? That's like, boom, they did something skillful. They timed something at the right time. It was limited window. That's what makes it special. I mean, if Fiora's repost was up every, you know, if Fiora's repost lasted 10 seconds, for example, right? If she just sits there and it lasts for 10 seconds, I mean, that would be kind of silly. But, like, if she could move around, for example, which is effectively what a lot of these things do, if she could move around and have that kind of power for 10 seconds, that wouldn't make it special. It'd be like, okay, she's blocking all damage or she's blocking a large portion of damage for an extended period of time. Um, there's no skill in that. You just do it. And so that's frustrating. So I think adding in more items like that, where there's like this quick, you know, minute, not minute, but like this quick moment of time where it's really powerful, demonstrates skill expression if you know how to time it, if you know how to do it at the right time, which once again, Redemption does this very well. You have this kind of delay, people can play around it, and then boom, there it is, it lands, it's this instant infusion of power, 
and then you can't do anything else for you know another minute a minute and a half right but it has that moment of true power if you do it correctly so i think that could be cool i think adding internal cooldowns to things like ardent sensor would be good so you can't put the ardent sensor on the same target more than once every 30 seconds so it would incentivize you to be very careful with who you're shielding and why instead of just spamming shields on everybody to keep it up permanently and i think in exchange for that you know you could add more power in ardent sensor so maybe it starts at 10 on hit damage and gives 20 percent attack speed but it's going to have a 30 second cooldown on it so i think doing more stuff like that where there are very clearly defined fail cases how you can mess up these items you can't mess up ardent sensor right now it just works right um you can't mess up knight's vow really it, you just put it on somebody and it works so adding more fail cases to it making people have to make more decisions and use it skillfully i think would be something and that would have people that would give more respect to people you know people like i'm a cutie pie could say damn he just used that nice vow and shut me out of this really you know when i was trying to do this ability or you know something like that i, I think that would be a much cooler way to do it reduce the power of point click supports and add like lower cooldowns across the board on everything on supports and just add more skill shots because I think that's what people like too. People like hitting skill shots and shooting skill shots, right? It forces interactivity. People don't like point click Janus shields. People don't like point click fears from fiddle sticks, right? Because it's seen as like brain dead, no skill, right? It's like, okay, there's another shield or okay, there's a fear. Um, so I would say lower the cooldown. Um, lower the cooldown. Uh, make more skill shots, lower the CC duration on stuff, like Morgana. I think that there shouldn't be longer than like a 1.5 second stun tops. So lower Fiddlesticks's, um, you know, crowd control down to 1.5 seconds, increase the range on it, make it a skill shot. Morgana, lower the cooldown on it. Um, may, uh, it already is a skill shot, but like lower the cooldown on it and that, that would be good. And lower the, um, the root duration to like 1.5 seconds. <coughs> And then try to do this with other abilities too. So like with Janna, for example, if you wanted to rework Janna, lower the cooldown on her Q, on her shield, and on her R. Remove the AD on her E and just have it do something else. Like maybe once the shield breaks, they get a little bit of movement speed. Um, like make a reward. If the shield breaks, if someone actually breaks it, then you get a reward for it. Um, instead of like put it so that way you wouldn't want to proactively put it on somebody to give extra ad to take a tower that doesn't make any sense like reward somehow reward janna for absorbing that damage for skillfully putting that shield on somebody who's going to take damage and then um you know give them some kind of bonus um you know lux is actually a pretty good example of this with her shield she has to throw it it's a decent shield it's a good size and it can hit people going out and going in but it's a skill shot. Now, not everybody has to have a Lux shield, but something like that, more of that, I think would be good um, for the game. Because then it's like, oh, wow, you know, they hit this person max range with a shield. Um, that was a really good play. So maybe like the further away the person is, the bigger the shield is, they get something like that. I think that could be cool. Um, I think Nami is a pretty good example of like an enchanter done right for the most part. I think they should make her W a skill shot because I think it's a little abusive early on that you can just go and point click that on people. But other than that, make the W a skill shot, but she's she's great. Like moderate scaling, one ability, has plus healing and shielding. She has multiple skill shots, you know, with her Q, with her R, and her E, um, you know, adds a little bit of extra reasonable utility. Some damage, some slow um you know so i think nami is a pretty good example to think about there's lots of counterplay to her kit um aside from just spamming w on people in lane that's kind of non-interactive to an extent but uh you know as far as like the bubble and the ult work those are really cool moments of power you hit that bubble on two or three people you're like yeah you miss the bubble you're like oh you know you miss the wave you're like oh but if you hit that wave you know max range wave on like three or four people you're like yeah you know so that's what you want you want those like really cool like you want the ups and downs you want the highs and lows you don't want the okay shield shield heal heal you know you want the yes i got it or the man pretend you didn't see that i failed like that's what you want I think a lot more and so they need to work on that more another problem is and i've talked about this a lot in past videos so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this is item poaching 
So you'll have other lanes take support items. So like Val, Locket, Shirelia, like these were intended for supports, but you'll get particularly tank junglers abusing this item. You had Vlad like abusing Shirelias. You had like GP abusing um, Targon's Brace. So just make it to where with the support items, you only um, you can only purchase an item if you have completed the support quest. And just make the quest like impossible to do for a solo lane. Right, so like something like the coin quest is a pretty good example of this um, for the most part. But yeah, and just say, you know what? You can't buy Knight's Vow, you can't buy Locky, you can't buy Shirelia's. Just make a certain class of items that you cannot buy those unless you meet this requirement, which is you completed the support quest. Easy. There are already limited items out there, right? For melee champions. If you look at the uh, Hydras, Titanic Hydra and um, Ravenous Hydra, you can't buy those unless you're melee. If you think about, um, you know, Knight's Vow, it has a severe penalty on it if you're ranged versus melee. I mean, I guess they could put a penalty on these items, you know, they, but the penalty is really sketchy with actives. Like, what are you going to do? Locket Shield is only half effective if you're not a support with a completed quest item? I don't know. I would just say that, like, just really simple. You can't buy this unless the quest is done. Kind of like you can't buy a jungle item unless you have Smite. They did that to stop people from abusing jungle items in like mid and top lane. It was a real simple thing. You have to have this specific summoner in order to unlock these items, right? And so I think it would be pretty easy to do in the game. Just say that it's grayed out unless you complete the quest. Just like right now, you can't get wards um, off of your uh, quest item. So they did it with Sightstone. It's basically you have to complete the quest to get a free Sightstone now. Um so just do that and just say, you know what? There's going to be certain items. We're just going to make it that way for support. So supports are welcome to buy other items that aren't on this list. So, for example, an AP support could still buy a Leandre's. But if they wanted to, in theory, you could create an, an AP support item that costs like 2,300 or 2,400 gold that only supports could buy. So you could make Twin Shadows, for example, a support-only item. And then you could balance it accordingly so that mid laners wouldn't abuse it. Um, so maybe you could give, like, lower the ghost cooldown to 60 seconds instead of 90 to help you scout a little bit more. So I think that's the way to go. And I think particularly with tanks, it's going to be really hard to see tanks that can have good items without, like, junglers abusing it unless they do this, right? They really need for, like, Knight's Vow, Locket, um, you know, and things like that to really only be available to supports. And then a final thing that I would like to see here would be to... In to implement a stat if they really want to differentiate good supports from bad supports is implement a stat called support power like take out plus healing and shielding and just say something like if you are doing good things as a support then you get a stat called support power or it could be like almost like a currency or something just something that stacks up it's kind of like collecting thresh souls or collecting like bard chimes like that type of stuff and just say something like um you know, if you're getting so many assists, if you have so much vision score, if you have so many team objectives or crowd control, you get this stat called support power. And your items scale off of that, kind of like with Bard and Thresh Souls, right? So if you get an item like Redemption, maybe you get one extra heal per point of support power that you have. And I don't, these are just arbitrary numbers. I don't know exactly what it would be, but just something like that that rewards you for being a better support. Your items get more powerful over time. I don't know if that's necessarily true. That could be really snowball-y. So if your team gets really far ahead in terms of objectives, because team objectives and vision control are both very snowball -y. Like, you can get better vision if your team's ahead, if your team has more objectives. And if your team gets more objectives, they can get more vision, which gives you even more objectives. So this might be too snowball-y, but I think it's an interesting idea to differentiate, you know, good supports from bad supports, if that's what something, if that's what people are interested in. So that's an idea. I don't think that necessarily has to happen. I do think this should happen, the poaching thing, and then I think just across the board, they should just say, you know what, supports are going to be primarily disruptors. We're going to lower their cooldowns on everything. Um, you know, we're going to add in more skill shots if we need to. We can lower the damage on some things. And just make that like the hallmark of supports. They have low cooldowns, lots of interactive opportunities. They have lots of chance to, chances to throw their skill shots to show that they are, you know, doing meaningful things in the game. 
So that should be a defining feature of supports that's different from any other role is they have pretty short cooldowns and they're able to constantly try to do stuff in the laning phase. So it's like, yeah, they can't CS, but they get lots of chances to throw their abilities. Just lower the cooldown, lower the mana cost, just lower everything and just allow them to spam stuff a lot of times in the lane. And like lower the impact of each thing. So like don't make things one shots like Morgana Qs pretty much. Um, but just that would give even more skill expression. So you're basically saying, look, you're not going to CS, but you're sure as hell going to be like dodging and throwing a lot of skill shots in lane. It's going to be interactive. It's going to be fun. You're going to get to decide who's the best support. I think that is, that would be interesting. Just put supports on permanent earth mode is basically what I'm saying. Not quite that extreme, but something like that where it is higher tempo, higher octane um, to give you more excitement in the bot lane, especially for people who are new to the support role. To allow people to say, dang, that support's really good because he was hitting and doing all of these things, or she was. Okay. I guess that's basically almost the end of this video. I'll just spend five minutes real quickly on the other stuff. Pretty much, I think the Bruiser stuff's really overpowered right now. If you look at um, that they're testing, the Atmos has um, 2015 base stats on it. Uh, it has, uh, if you have 2,000 max HP, then it gives 1,750 gold worth of stats. It only costs 2,900, so it's pretty disgusting. I think a way they could balance it is make it bonus HP rather than total HP, and that would make it more reasonable. And that way, even if you have 1,000 bonus HP, which is totally possible to get, um, off of just a handful of items, then it would yield uh, 1225. So maybe bonus HP would be a little extreme, but that would force people like, look, if you want to make this offensive item good, you have to actually get a lot of defense because right now it's just going to be insanely good all the time, pretty much. Or they could lower the number on it, take it down from, you know, 0.25%, take it down to like, I don't know, 0 .1, 0 0.15 or something or 1.5% instead of 2.5%, I mean to say. So, um, either way, too strong right now. Either make it bonus AP or just lower the stats on it overall. It's just too many good things. It has armor, magic resist, and gives just a crap ton of AD. You know, gives around like 75 to 100 AD on a typical bruiser as like a second or third item. So, Jen, this item is extremely toxic and insanely powerful. Uh, it's just is way way too good way too good and i really don't like the stat that is um it's basically true defense so armor penetration and uh magic penetration don't apply to this it just reduces damage so this is something that like warwick has and irelia has and it's super toxic because the only way to counter this is true damage and I think it just creates an arm race between true defense and true damage, pretty much. It's like, just use the systems you have in the game. Just use AD, AP, magic resistant armor. Like, what's hard about that? Just have this say, instead of damage reduction, just have it say, gives you so much armor. Gives you so much magic resist. Because the problem is, this is armor and magic resist that can't be reduced. So it's like, on steroids, armor and magic resist. I mean, look at this. 20 plus 10% of your bonus AD. Even if you only have 100 AD, bonus AD, right? So that's not that hard to get. 10% of your bonus attack damage. Um, I mean, this item itself gives you 60. So you're on your way already. You just need 40 extra AD off of anything else. That would give you 30 block at all times. And then if you are in a team fight, it gives you 90 block for six seconds that gets refreshed on a takedown not even a kill just a kill or an assist just for some quick math on what that means 90 damage reduction because damage reduction this is the problem with bone plating bone plating right now let's see how much bone plating so bone plating right now is so overpowered that everybody takes this rune everybody supports take it mid laners take it top laners take it everybody and their mother takes this room maybe not 80 carries maybe not junglers but like so many people take this it's insane and look at the stats on this okay this is it only lasts it doesn't last when the person hits you so it can be baited out but for the next only three attacks every 45 second cooldown only three attacks apply this and it's 15 to 40 based on level and it's already overpowered they've nerfed it twice 
and it still is taken by everybody. And it's only 15 to 40 on three attacks with a 45 second cooldown. And it's overpowered. Now we look at this. If you just have something as simple as 100 bonus attack damage. Hell, if you don't have any bonus attack damage. If you run no bonus attack damage. It still gives you 20. Permanently. Permanently. No 45 second cooldown. Permanently gives you 20. And if you have like any amount of AD, it's going to give you at least 30. A lot of times. For all attacks, not three attacks, not 45 second cooldown, every single attack. That alone would make this item probably overpowered. That alone would make it overpowered. But now, if you're in a team fight, it triples. Just triples. That's mind boggling. Look at this. So, if you're doing 200 damage as an auto attack with an AD carry, which is quite a bit, um, if you are in a team fight against this person, you have 90 damage block. If you have 100 armor, that 200 damage is going to get reduced by 50%. That's going to go down to 100 damage. And then the 90 true defense applies. So, you're only doing 10 damage to that Irelia with this item. 10 damage off of your 200 damage auto attack so you know you've got your completed whatever bloodthirster or something and then you have 100 base ad you know like 200 ad is quite a bit you're doing 10 damage oh you just hit them with a spell that does 200 damage they have 100 magic resist you're doing 10 damage what who designed this like, what is this? That is so stupid. If you're doing a damage over time ability, you're doing zero damage. Zero damage. I'm pretty sure that's how that's going to work. So you throw your Malzahar visions on them or whatever, and it does whatever per tick. It's now doing zero damage because this 90 defense, it has, like, it's not bone plating. It's not three ticks and you're out. It's permanent. So if someone hits you up, like a Fiddlesticks ult. Fiddlesticks ults you, it does probably zero damage. Pretty close to it. I mean, let's look, let's look at Fiddlesticks here real quick. Like, this is disgusting against damage over time stuff. Zyra's got a bunch of plants on you. Zero damage. You're invulnerable. So, like, look at this thing. Okay, so let's say that Fiddlesticks ults right on top of your face. You have, you know, 100 magic resist. Or whatever. Now, you may not have 100 magic resist. You're also buying Shoujins or whatever. But, you know, don't forget these. a lot of these champions get magic resist per level. But anyways, let's just do it just for the sake of for the sake of science here, right? You have 225 divided by 2. You're going to be blocking 50% of it. Minus 90 damage from Shoujins. You're taking 22.5 damage per tick. Per second for... Five seconds. So times five. So now you're taking... If you sit in an entire Fiddlesticks ult with this active, a level 11 Fiddlesticks ult with this active, if you have 100 magic resist, you are going to be taking 113 damage instead of 1,125. So you're blocking 1,000 damage off of this item. 1,000 damage from one person. So if Malzahar throws Malefic Visions on you and then ults you and then Fiddlesticks ults you, you're probably taking literally 112 damage. I mean, let me look at Malzahar here. Okay, all of Malzahar's little minions or whatever that attack you, they're doing zero damage because each one of those is going to get reduced. So that doesn't matter. Malefic Visions... Magic damage per half second. Yep, all of those are less than 90. So each each instance where they do damage to you gets reduced by 90. So that's zero damage. I don't, I'm not interested in total. I want per 0.25 seconds. Okay, yep, zero damage. All of that's less than 90. Because there's no cooldown on this, right? Am I, I'm not reading this wrong. Reduces damage from champion attacks and abilities by 20 plus 10%. When near at least three enemy champions land a basic attack to gain this. 200% more damage for six seconds 
block 200% more damage. Yeah. So, like, literally, cannon ult. So, like, literally, you can have a Malzahar ult you, and then Fiddlesticks ult on top of you, and then cannon come in and ult you, and you're probably going to take, like, 150 damage from all three of those. Because each one of those, each instance of damage is going to be blocked by 90. Now, combine that with something like Adaptive Helm, if you want to, where it's going to be reduced even more. I mean, you're, you're taking no damage. Like, with this, especially Damage Over Time Champions, which is auto attacks from the enemy AD carry, you're taking 10 damage. You know, that, that Kai'Sa can sit there and just keep auto attacking you. You're going to take 10 damage. Because all of her on hits, those are separate triggers. I'm pretty sure those are separate triggers, too. It depends on how the damage over time is dealt with and separate triggers. But if they're separate triggers, <coughs> each one of those is going to get reduced by 90. So that Trinity Force or whatever on hit interaction, that's going to get reduced by 90. The um, auto attack portion of it, that's going to get reduced by 90. Just everything that's a separate trigger of damage, I believe, is going to be reduced by 90 in this case. That's only if you have 100 AD. If you start to get to more than that, if you have like 200 AD, you're going to be blocking like 120 damage. So, you know, and it's cost efficient. You pay, you pay nothing for this. The value on this thing is 2,900 gold. If you go through and do all the math on this, like the attack damage, the health, and the cooldown reduction, this is all, uh, that's, that's about 2,900 gold worth of value there. So this is all free. This is probably the dumbest item I've ever seen. And I'm not usually that critical of Riot, but this is ridiculously overpowered. They had better nerf this. Like, I don't even know what they could nerf it to. They could literally just only make this unique passive blocks 20 damage, and it would still be extremely strong. Even if it had no scaling whatsoever. Oh, it's a maximum of 70, though, so watch out. Um... What? Like, all you need is 30. E even if it's just 20 and gets tripled to 60, that still is going to take those auto attacks instead of 10 damage. You know, they're going to be doing like 40 damage a pop to you instead. Fiddlesticks is still not going to do any damage to you. Malzar is still not going to do any damage to you. This is an extremely toxic stat. Extremely toxic. Because it applies after armor and magic resist. It doesn't scale multiplicative with it. It, it applies after. And it's just a flat reduction. It's not percentage-based. So it just destroys damage over time stuff. It, it's ridiculous. There's no way they release this item. Like, it has to be nerfed. Um, finally, uh, Sterics Gauge, and then we'll move on. The Hydras are fine. I think they're lowering the cost by um, 250, and they're lowering the uh, the gold value. They're taking 80 off of it. They're taking 350 AD worth of gold value off. And so it's losing like 100 gold worth of efficiency, but you can also get it a lot faster. A lot of people are getting these things for the uh, actives anyways. Like, the AD's nice, but... Like, Irelia doesn't have a ton of AD ratios, so that's fine. Celerity nerf is good. It needs to be nerfed. Hail of Blades still won't matter. Sterix, I'll have to break down the final numbers on this. This is good for everyone that doesn't use a Trinity Force. Um, it's not melee only, is it, or is it? I can't remember. If it's not melee only, this could actually be a decent defensive item for um, like some ranged champions, but it, it might be melee only. But anyways, I, I think this is this is good. This is fine. It's gonna be good on a lot of champs that don't um, that don't get Trinity Force. Even on Trinity Force, if the champion has some kind of like, um, if they're gonna be getting AD, I think that's fine. I mean, I think items are really toxic if they give you a lot of defense and offense on the same item, and like the interaction between this and Trinity Force is just too strong right now. So assuming that they nerf the crap out of this item, Spear of Sochin, which they should. Um, and Atmas, I don't know, like, Atmas and Spear are both really toxic. This is, like, absurdly toxic. Atmas is pretty toxic for that, so, I don't know. The, the funny thing about me, uh, when I watched Hashinashin's reaction to these items, he complained. Like, he complained about, he thought that Bruisers, that I really is still going to be underpowered, even with Atmas, even with Spear of Sojin. He's like, nah, man, they're changing Steric's gauge. Like, they're making it bonus AD instead of base AD. That's it. Gray, you know, uh, Jax, Irelia, they're, they're awful. They're terrible, right? Doesn't know what they're doing. I thought for sure that they had Hashinashin running 
the balance team for this patch. Because this is, like, so ludicrously powerful. Atmos is so ludicrously powerful. Like, this is ludicrous. Atmos is strong. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, Irelia and Jax, like, those type of champions are going to have a field day with this. Like, Renekton, Jesus. Like, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, it, it's just, it's absurd. E even something like Riven is just, like, going to be unstoppable. Anybody. I would probably buy this on, like, Janna right now. I'm being, like... You buy this on everybody. I mean, it basically makes you invulnerable permanently. <laughs> Just about. I mean, anyways. Okay, well, this video is way longer than I wanted it to be, but hopefully this gives you some insight into what's going on with support, what I think would be, like, decent uh, fixes to the support. I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff. Other stuff's fine. I mean, n none of this other stuff's going to define the meta. They're nerfing Kai'Sa. That's good. Um, the big one is they're nerfing Rageblade maybe to 3600 gold cost that's actually really huge that'll nerf kaisa a ton it'll nerf master yi a ton it'll nerf varus it'll make lucian unstoppable um because a lot of his main counters will be out of the game but anyways i, I think that's that's fair i think 3500 is fine they might make it 3600 they're kind of going back and forth on that. that's fine sejuani could be an interesting support champion i'll monitor that i'll tell you when the patch comes out uh, Rumble, Poppy, not going to matter. Lee, not going to matter that much. It, it's a good step in the right direction, but he needs more help. Uh, Kindred, not going to matter. Elise, that's actually pretty good. Hopefully she'll come back into the meta, but that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Uh, remember, if you enjoy this content, I'll try to do some faster content in the future, but if you enjoy it, be sure to like, subscribe, come check us out on the stream, and I'll see you next time. Have a good day.